So we're going to deal with the third dimension or the third aspect of revitalization, um, which is the spiritual dimension. And the strap line is improving worship and discipleship in the church. Um, in one sense, it's very logical. It's not logical because um, I said that the, uh, as, as we we saw the healthy church is the gospel at the center. So Christians learning to love God, which is the, right, the spiritual side, loving others, the social side, in their cultural context, the societal side. But in another sense, um, I, I've talked about this with others like uh, with, with Daniel, and we, we said the, f the easiest thing in one sense is to first of all, encourage Christians to have better relationships with people around them, to exercise hospitality, to join a club, that's all the, the social side. And as they then um, live out the social side, then you have the, they, they realize the societal aspects because they realize that people don't think like we do and that they become very um, aware of that. So in that sense, in a, chronologically, the spiritual side, that is what we do when we're together, can flow from that because then um, we can go into um, uh, Hebrews, which I mentioned the other day, which I think we'll mention again, that we meet together to encourage each other to love and good works. So what... I want to do this this morning is talk very much about what we do when we gather and in particular when we gather in what we call our, our Sunday service or whatever word you use um, uh, different churches may be using other different vocabulary though I think service is probably the most common uh, commonly used word and so the question is how can we deepen our spiritual life, our relationship with God, a desire to live a holy and caring life. So I'd like to start with this uh, quotation or verse from Ephesians, by keeping Christ central in our thoughts and by being a people to the praise of his glorious grace, because in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So I'd like to mention four things which I think we should be doing when we meet together as a, a church. Um, the first is marveling at all the, that the Lord is and does and expressing our heartfelt praise. Secondly, enabling each participant to remember who we are, what our true identity is. Thirdly, encouraging each other. And fourthly, preparing us to live as a scattered church throughout the rest of the week. So. The rest of this morning is going to be going through those, those four points. So the first one, marveling at all that the Lord is and does and expressing our heartfelt praise. So the gospel is the center. It's the, the top thing on what a healthy church is. It's the center and should lead us to live each day. Now, I apologize for this. In a previous life, before I was reincarnated as a pastor, I was a teacher, and one of, one of the subjects I taught was Latin. I was a Latin teacher. So, um, Latin is good for theology. Sub specie crucis, in the light of the cross, and sub suspie eternitatis, in the light of eternity. That is what we want to live, the light, in the light of the cross, and in the light of eternity. So, the gospel is the center, because it's through the cross that we are reconciled with God, start our Christian life, and are all moving inexorably day by day towards eternity, eternity with the Lord. And the gospel should be the center. And I was talking to one of the members of the group here to say we, we should be careful on that because it can easily become assumed and not central. And uh, I was talking about the, uh, the annual congress of our denomination in Paris only two or three weeks ago and I actually talked to the worship leader afterwards and I said okay this morning this Sunday morning we sang seven songs do you realize that the first six songs a Jew or a Muslim could have sung he was very surprised 
because none of them mention Jesus. The songs weren't heretical. They weren't wrong. Some of them were based on the Psalms and so on, saying that God is good and God is great. And we can trust him and so on. But it wasn't until we got to the seventh and last song that Jesus was mentioned. And I think we have to be very careful because I go into a lot of churches and I see the same thing. Or when I hear people praying, they pray about all sorts of things. Are they really thankful for the absolute essential in 1 Corinthians 15? Um, it's Jesus crucified according to the scriptures, buried, risen the third day according to the scriptures. If you hold on to that, you're saved. And true, there's so many things we have to learn as Christians, but we can never leave that basis. So we must keep the, the, the gospel central. And so by keeping it central um, from generation to generation, as the center of our spiritual life, we can fight against these twin dangers which have always been there since the beginning of Christianity. Uh, one is the legalism, imposing certain ways of doing things. Uh, you, all, you all have stories about this, but I remember a couple in my church, in a previous church in Paris. Um, he was, uh, they came from the Caribbean and he was, a, they were a really wonderful couple. And um, he was, we, we pointed him as an elder in the church, really very spiritual man. And he was, um, in fact, a, a policeman, and he was appointed back to the Caribbean, to the French-speaking Caribbean. And when they joined the church, uh, they, were, they were really told that you are not spiritual because the wife was wearing earrings. And that's the sort of thing that, that, that legalism can lead to, all the little outward things that you have to do or not do. We have to fight against that. And the other thing is routine, always doing things in the same way. And I was very surprised that uh, one year we did a, an evaluation uh, in the evening service that we were holding in our church in Paris. And one young woman said, um, what I want is to be surprised every time I come to the service. <laughs> I, want, I want something new. Because younger people, um, they're skipping from one site to another all the time. Uh, it's, if after about two minutes is not interesting, they, they go to something else. Now, I was talking to a filmmaker the other day who said, you, you can't film something which is 30 minutes. It had to be 10 minutes. Now it's about four minutes. Or on TikTok, it's two minutes or something. It, it's, you, you, you have to keep changing not for the sake of change, but because um, the mind is like this. You want to be surprised. Going through routine isn't, isn't important. Now, some things will be good to always have. I, I, I like the Lord's Supper from time to time. I think as well that we should be reading the scriptures more. A lot of evangelical churches don't open the Bible from the beginning until the time that they preach from it. I, I'm surprised at that, but it's, it's the case. So we want to avoid routine, and the only way we can fight against routine, I think, is um, by keeping the, the gospel central. The second point is uh, enabling each participant to remember who they, who we are, what our true identity is. This is so important in today's world. Identity is the number one question that people have today. Who are we? Um, and you get to the point that you even uh, can think you can choose your gender, which is biologically impossible. But everyone wants to be able to choose things. I mean, it's part of life. I mean, uh, I remember last time I bought a car. The the only thing the the salesman was interested in was all the options that I that I wanted. Uh, <laughs> what do you want? Do you want this? Do you want that? Although at the end he turned to my wife and said, you know, what what color do you want it to be? It's always the wife who chooses the color, <laughs> apparently. Um, so, we chose grey. Nice Parisian colour. <laughs> so, what is our identity? Here are eight magnificent things about being a Christian. Um, we, we, we did this as a, a follow-up to, uh, to a network um, a few, few, few months ago. We have a new and lasting identity as a child of God. That is the number one identity. And that is why in an urban church like we are in Paris, we can have people who are 
from different backgrounds, different social classes, different characters and so on, because above everything else, our identity is we're children of God. So we can accept each other on those grounds. That's really, really important. And we know who we are. The second magnificent thing is we can accept that we have done wrong, be forgiven and avoid feeling we are victims. Now, in today's society, especially in woke culture, the idea of being a victim of things is really central. It's not our fault. If we succeed in life, it's because we're good. We've, we've managed. If we fail, it's the fault of other people. <laughs> we are victims of our situation. And even when um, you, 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 you go to a lot of psychologists and, and so on, um, they're very often, not always, but they're very often going to say, it doesn't matter, be yourself. And do, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's not really right and wrong. We can say, yeah, we have done wrong, but we don't have guilt. And I remember um, a, a, a doctor telling me he worked with uh, older people and he said very often he's seen older people die with tears because they regretted something. They felt guilty about things. We don't need to feel guilty because we're forgiven. So other people don't want to talk about right and wrong because they don't want to feel guilty. But we can say we've done wrong and be forgiven. <laughs> so when we, it, it, it avoids being victims of a, of a situation. It's really a magnificent thing. Thirdly, we have become part of a community which is both worldwide and local, our local church. And I, I said during uh, the COVID, what I miss most was being it was worshiping God with people I knew and loved. That, that was great. People I knew and loved. And that was, that, that's, but at the same time, I, I think it's absolutely remarkable. We can come to a place like this where I've been to all sorts of countries and you meet other Christians and you, you feel a bond of brotherhood with them. It's, it's, it's remarkable. So we are part of a community which is both worldwide and local. So we're not alone. Fourthly, we can regularly examine our lives without fear and allow God to change us. And I think this is a, a remarkable thing um, that we have as Christians. We forget that. When we meet together on a Sunday morning, we can stop and think about our lives. Um, how many people stop every week and think about their lives? This is an opportunity we have. And that's why sometimes I think let's be careful that we don't try to go from one thing to another so quickly that we don't have time to think. Now, now I, I'll give you an example of that. Um, I, I love art. Um, I've written a book in French on a Christian approach to the arts. And I, because I live in Paris, I've got a, a card that enables me to go into the Louvre uh, all year. I've got an annual subscription. The advantage, there are two advantages. One, I don't have to queue with other the tourists. <laughs> I've got my own entrance that I can go into <laughs> straight away. But secondly, because it's an annual subscription, when I go, I never look at more than two or three paintings. And I stay a long time in front of them to, to look at the paintings, take the time. Or another example, um, I like music. When you go to a, a concert, um, you're concentrating on it. You've got nothing else to do but to be there. Whereas it's true at home, I put on a headset and when I'm working, I'm listening to music. But I'm not concentrating on it in the same way. When we're together as a church, we can concentrate on something. We can ask questions. We can give time to people to think. We can look at our lives and allow God to change it. Again, without guilt, we're forgiven. And God wants to change us. A fifth magnificent thing is we know good and evil really exist so we can work for justice and mercy in the world. A lot of people are committed to all sorts of humanitarian projects. We know why. We know why. Um, good and evil really exist. Um, I remember talking to, a, I used to meet a young man regularly for, for coffee and um, as far as I know, he hasn't become a Christian yet and he's moved away. But after a few months, he said, well, you've done something in my life. He was quite a committed sort of 
bit on the left wing. He said, um, I still am committed to the left wing, but now I don't know why. <laughs> I've got no <laughs> reason to believe there's really good and evil <laughs> to fight. So, well, maybe it was a step <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the right direction. And so we know that we really can fight for good and against evil. And in one sense, um, as a church, social action is interesting, or even people's jobs are interesting. Why? The church, we, we believe in the fall. We believe that sin is there. The answer is the gospel. So the church preaches the gospel. But as a, in social action, we are trying to reduce the effects of the fall out of love for people. So even everyone's job is doing that. As a doctor, you're trying to reduce the effects of the fall. As a teacher, you're trying to help people to think better. Um, but whatever it is, you're trying to reduce the effects of the fall out of love for people. You, you can't remove them. So the, the church is preaching the gospel. But we can do good. We should be doing good around us. A sixth magnificent thing. We can live with contentment and thank God wholeheartedly for what we've got. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. I think it was Augustine who said that happiness is to desire what we already have. And I like that. You desire what we already have. And sometimes with my wife, we look and we say, oh yeah, we're, we're, that little table we've got that we really like. <laughs> or I, I bought a new sort of jacket last year and I, I keep, every time I put it on, I say, oh, wow. I really, I really like this, <laughs> and not wanting another one. <laughs> to desire what we have and be contented. Read 1 Timothy chapter 6 <laughs> about contentment. And so we can praise God, and that makes us happy. The opposite of joy isn't sadness. Yes, we have to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. The opposite of joy, in my opinion, is complaining. And that is what the Bible tells us not to do, to complain. So the best way is to thank God for all sorts of things all the time. Seventh magnificent thing. We are not totally at a loss in the face of suffering. We may not have all the answers, but we know God is with us. We know that he knows why. We don't know sometimes why things happen to us, but God knows, so we can trust him. And so we're not at a loss in the face of suffering. And the final one is, it goes even further, we have confidence in the face of death. We know that death doesn't have the last word. These are eight magnificent things. And we need to keep coming back to this over and over and over when we meet together as Christians to remember this. These, is, we're not against things, again, when, when I was talking to the young people in our evening service, they didn't like it when people were complaining, the older people. It was better in the past, or look at things the way it's going now. True, we must be lucid, we must have a clear understanding, but we can also think things very positively. So I think that's, that's, that's very important. So that's the second thing that when we meet together. The third thing, these are the each other's or the one another's, uh, in, in the New Testament, love one another, accept one another, forgive one another, spur one another on towards love and good deeds, be kind and compassionate to one another, live in harmony with one another, have brotherly affection for one another, be at peace with, another, with one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, confess sins to one another, pray for one another, instruct one another, care for one another, be hospitable to one another, save one uh, serve one another in love, bear one another's burdens. Uh, the Greek word most of the time is alilus, uh, it's one another. Are we living this out when we come together in our churches? And how do we do it? Because maybe too often we sit in rows. And how do we do these things? Small groups might be, might be a thing. that I, I can't tell you. This is one of the big advantages of small churches <laughs> is more easy maybe to get to know people because as we said the other day, a small church isn't necessarily an unhealthy church. A big church maybe has more challenges to live that out than a smaller church. And, and to be honest, um, it depends on your culture, but I, 
I think probably that a, a lot of French people would prefer to have four churches of 50 members than one church of 200 in our culture. Um, we, French culture doesn't necessarily go in for big, big numbers. It's uh, perhaps because people are very individualistic. So the question is, and I can't tell you how to do this, but I think we should be thinking, how do we encourage this in a church, which is part of revitalization? The fourth thing um, I'll probably spend more time on, which is that we meet together as a gathered church to live as a scattered church throughout the rest of the week. And I quoted just now Hebrews 10, we meet together to encourage each other to love and good deeds. And we do it through these four relational networks that you all know by heart now, uh, which is the family, local community, neighborhood, place of work or education, friends, and leisure time. And that is where we will be living 97% of our lives, just 3% when we meet together. So how do we prepare ourselves to do this? Now, what does this imply? Firstly, practical teaching on discipleship in the wider sense, living as salt and light in the world. Now, there are all sorts of, way of ways of doing discipleship, and I don't think one way is better than another. Having small groups of discipleship or one-on-one, -on -one, one to one work on discipleship, great. But I think that we mustn't, think that when we're together as a church, the whole church, we're not doing discipleship. Because when we're preaching the word and, and, and giving practical applications, we are doing discipleship, even on a Sunday morning. And I, I remember talking to, a, to a, someone from a church, um, he was a, even a church leader who said, well, uh, our preaching, it's, it's nothing to do with discipleship. We do discipleship during the week. I don't think that's true. All our preaching and everything we do together when we gather is also discipleship. So that means, among other things, and this is, for me, very, very important, and possibly the most radical part of what I say about revitalization, is that we need to teach on today's issues in the light of the Bible so that, well, I put, we can dialogue with people around us, uh, leading to the gospel, but also, it's for protection for the Christians. If we don't know what the mindset of people around us is, we can be very, very easily influenced. So in a sense, um, what are we doing when we meet together as a church in today's world? I would say we're doing two things. Helping people to learn how to distinguish truth from fake news and how to avoid being manipulated. And we must do everything we can in our churches not to manipulate people to do things. It, 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 we're in a world of manipulation. You have narcissistic people who are manipulating others all the time. It's, it, it's a, I don't know if you come across this in your country, but this is now seen as a, as a psychological thing. We call it um, narcissistic perverts. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's the medical term which is, which is used, where people are trying to manipulate other people all the time. And we have to teach people that and model in the church, we're not manipulating anyone. And we're helping you to learn the difference between truth and fake news and how do you do this. So, I think we should be doing this when we meet together as a whole church on a Sunday morning, which is the time most, most people meet. But we have a problem there. Um, so I... I I was going to talk about the other thing later, but uh, um, we have a problem because very often the model that most people have in their heads for a church service only includes two things. We meet together for worship, which is understood as being singing um, or prayer. We meet together to hear the word of God in teaching the Bible. But I think we should be doing four things when we meet together. So I, I managed to find this acronym, AIMS. <laughs> what are our aims when we meet together? Um, the first is 
the A of adoration and amazement. You know, we worship in amazement of God's grace towards us. The second is issues, that is the questions that we're facing in today's society to help train disciples to live in today's world. Mission, sending out the congregation as a scattered church. And the scriptures, that is the Bible teaching. And generally we do A and S, but we forget the I and the M. And I think a revitalized church needs to include that. Um, let me just go back a step, because as I said, we have a model in our minds of what a service is. So is it legitimate to do all this each Sunday in our church? Uh, so what does the New Testament teach about services and worship? I think if you, if you look in the New Testament, there are only four words, uh, four, three times rather, sorry, three times when the word um, worship um, is used in the New, in the New Testament. Um, there may be some other ones, but these, these are the, the essential ones. And this, in, in fact, in our uh, French language, the, the word for a service is the same word as worship, is a synonym. So um, this is even, <laughs> even stronger, in a sense, uh, as a way of thinking. Worship is, not, is, an, is an attitude, not just something we do at a certain time of the week. I think that's really important to understand that. Romans 12. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, or in some translations, reasonable act of worship. We don't just offer our bodies as living sacrifices between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> it's all week. Or Philippians 3. We who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Hopefully, we're not putting any confidence in the flesh at 8 o'clock in the evening on Wednesday. <laughs> it's not just between 10 and 12 on Sunday morning. Hebrews 12. Let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. I think we should be living in reverence and awe when I'm waiting for the metro in this, on, this, on the underground station or when I'm waiting for the bus or, or whatever I'm doing. Reverence and awe. So... Worship is an attitude, not just a thing we do. And if you look in the New Testament, the word which is used, the vocabulary which is used, um, isn't service, which is in fact the literal translation of the Greek word for worship, latria, which means service. You're serving God. And you, you, you come across this all through the Old Testament. People are servants of God or serving God uh, in in the English language, service corresponds to that. In German, uh, Gottesdienst, you've got the word service again, you're serving God. But the only word used in the New Testament uh, is meeting. Now, I could go through all these verses, I won't. Um, you can note them down uh, in Acts 20, um, where they were meeting, and, uh, and um, there's a young man, apparently, who fell asleep looking at his, his iPhone and fell out the window uh, on the fourth floor. Um, or in 1 Corinthians, when you meet together, and in both in 11 and 14, and James, when, when you're meeting together and someone comes into your meeting, uh, and so on. It's it, the, the word meeting, that's all. It's actually the same word used for the um, Sanhedrin, um, or actually the same word used in the New Testament for the the riot by the silversmiths <laughs> as well. And, um, so we, we are meeting together. There's nothing magical about it. And um, I, I wrote an article which was published in a theological magazine in French, um, of which the title was, Is the word culte, which means service, a trap? Because we're, we're forced into thinking we only do certain things when we gather together, whereas in fact we should be doing a lot more so I come back to these four things, the, not just the adoration or worship, not just the scriptures, but issues and mission. Um, what do I mean by issues? Um, I think the best thing I can do, again, I've got a whole list. These are subjects which I have dealt with in our Sunday services in the last five years. I, I'm not 
imagining anything. These are actual things which I have talked about at different times in our Sunday services. So, uh, firstly, um, everything about today's society. What is postmodern thought? Or um, what is secularism? What is wokeism? Even in the church plant we've just started, we had, whole, whole, had a whole service on what is woke culture. All sorts of ethical issues, the beginning and end of life. Everything which is LGBT plus 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 plus, ecology, racism. We, we have to bring these subjects up. So I'll give you the example, the, the end of life. Um, in France, we recently had a, what they call a, a citizen's convention on the end of life. And by a majority, not a total majority, they recommended some move towards euthanasia, which the government then wants to start thinking about. So we had a whole service on this. We, we sang worship songs about how God gives us life. My colleague preached on life. <laughs> and then I gave a whole teaching on giving arguments we can use as Christians on common grounds with our fellow citizens on why euthanasia might not be a good thing. And among other things, which is interesting, the official body of medical doctors in France refuses it. They don't want to be involved. They've refused it. Although the government wants to push it, but the doctors don't. Because it's difficult to heal with one hand and, and kill with another, for example. So we, that was, that was, the whole service was based on life and end of life and these issues. But there are all sorts of other things. I, I've talked about the history of the church. Um, I've taught on um, Augustine, um, also Calvin, Luther, given the history. People don't, people don't know because, as we said earlier, people are intelligent, but they're ignorant. They don't know. Um, this is a parenthesis, but I once had the most extraordinary experience in a suburban trade in Paris. I was reading a book about the Reformation, and the guy next to me said, well, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Can you explain the Reformation to me? He said, because I'm a history teacher, but I'm a Muslim and I don't understand. And I had four stations <laughs> on this suburban train to explain the gospel to him and what the Reformation was. I mean, it's an extraordinary experience, in fact. Um, so people don't know. Um, I also teach about uh, my great friend Blaise Pascal, uh, the greatest philosopher in, <laughs> in France. Um, 400th anniversary of his birth next month. So I'm, I'm, several churches have asked me to give talks on Pascal. He is fantastic. We talked about the Crusades and the wars of religion and the Reformation. Also missions. Uh, from time to time, part of our service will say, for example, I was in North Macedonia um, in March. So part of our service, I told them about the church, the, the situation in Macedonia, the church in Macedonia. We prayed for North Macedonia. It was important for people to know what's going on in different places. Um, I talk about other religions. Um, I, I got a, a former Muslim to come and explain how we can witness better to other Muslims. And also, um, we did a service recently on the persecution of Christians. We, we gave the facts and figures from Open Doors and talked about the persecution of Christians. So that's another whole thing. Then the arts talk about films, um, books, uh, exhibitions, television series. I mean, we, we can't do, do everything. But sometimes we need to bring these, these things up and to find someone, if I can't do it, to find someone else who can. How, what do we think of these things? Then there's the amazing created world. Um, I try to explain the difference between the scientific method and bi biblical revelation um, so that people don't understand there's no contradiction between the two. Um, I did a whole service on famous Christian scientists as well, all through history. Um, I got a, um, a doctor to come, um, a neurologist to come and talk about the brain. Absolutely fantastic. How, how is it possible that the brain can just sort of evolve? And I, I got another guy to come and talk about the ears. I mean, it, it's extraordinary language. Language. Um, 
it's just impossible for language to sort of evolve. No one, even the, the greatest linguists, it can explain the origins of language. And I was talking to a, um, a linguistics professor from, uh, from the Baltic states who said that she belongs to an international association of linguists and they will not accept any research on the origins of language. They say it's not possible. We'll never know. We can't know. But it, the very fact that I, c I can make sounds with my m mouth and these sounds can reach your brain through the, the, the waves of the air, how they can then go into your ears, which are focused the sound well, and hit the whatever it is, I don't know the word in English, a tympanus or something, um, which transfers it through these little bones in one cubic centimeter, multiplies the sound by 20, which then transmits it into electronic signals that arrive in your brain. And you understand, if we use these the same language, what I'm saying. It's absolutely extraordinary. And without language, we can't make promises. I mean, we can shout and say, like a, an animal, there's danger over there. But we need language to make a promise. So I think that's why God created us with language, because he is the creator of the galaxies. And how could he communicate to us without language? And to be honest, every wedding that I conduct, I say this. You, you, ladies and gentlemen, you're going you're gonna to be attending something absolutely remarkable. Two human beings are going to make a promise to each other using language, which affects the rest of their life. It's, 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 it's real human dignity. Okay, I, I'm very interested in linguistics. <laughs> but, but if we teach this, by teaching this, we're saying, when people are talking around the coffee machine, we've got some interesting things to say. <laughs> Do you realize that I'm understanding what you're saying? <laughs> it's coffee time. <laughs> I say the words, he understands. <laughs> Christian conduct, use of time, use of money, Christian attitude to work, how do we forgive, the use of social media, uh, use or abuse of psychology, use of leisure time, addictions, marriage, bringing up children, all these subjects talk about when we are together gathered on a Sunday morning. Because if we don't do it then, when will we do it?